I'm sure a few more will come in as, as, as we go along. And we've kind of learned a lot about each other just <laughs> as if you're talking. So I guess I won't do a formal introduction if that's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me to come and talk to the group. And uh, this, I am, a, as I was telling you, a, a, I'm a board certified in nodal laryngology, head and neck surgery, but my fellowship after I finished residency was in otology and neurotology and that's essentially what my practice has been since I have been in practice. And I've been here at the university now for about five years more full time or than previous to that I was just coming uh, you know on a from a private practice sector up here involved uh, with the residents on a maybe once a week basis. So uh, today we're I was asked to talk a little about hearing loss, and uh, that's a broad subject to cover. But I, I hope this will be useful to you. We're just going to discuss a, this is a brief presentation, but uh, some basic uh, anatomy, real basic anatomy of the ear, and talk about uh, the different types of hearing losses that we have, and uh, also talk about the common causes are the common entities we see in the different types of hearing loss and also some of the things that have come about in the last few years to help people with their hearing that uh, is uh, quite significant uh, in our history of uh, treating ear problems. Oh, so uh, this is probably real repetitious to you, but just to make you familiar with the ear again. You know, the ear is divided into three parts, the external, the ear canal up the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, and then the middle ear space, and then the inner ear. The middle ear space houses the three little bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and is connected to the eustachian tube that goes to the nose, where the pressure equalizes in the middle ear. And then the inner ear has the cochlea, which is uh, the, uh, where the hair cell, the nerve endings for hearing is. There's 30,000 in the cochlea. It goes two and a quarter turns. And the low, the, well, I'm sorry. The, the high frequencies start, and as you go further around, it gets the low frequencies of these uh, nerve endings. And right connected with the inner ear is the semicircle canals, which is part of our balance system. Balance is controlled by this structure, the semicircle canal, the vestibular part, your vision and proprioceptive pressure points in your joints, particularly in the lower uh, extremities. So when dealing with hearing loss, we deal with two principal kinds. You have centroneural, which is uh, related to the inner ear, or you have a conductive loss, which is related usually to the middle and external ear, or you can have a mixture of the two. Let's go, so uh, this picture is better. So if you have something obstructing the hearing going into the ear, like here, or something wrong with the eardrum, or something wrong with the little bones, that's the conduction. It's not be the sound is not being conducted properly, or as it should be into the inner ear. So the inner ear could be perfectly okay, but the, it's not getting the sound at the same amplitude it should be because something is impeding the sound. And then the, the central neural loss would be related to the inner ear, which is something to do with the, either the cochlea, the nerve endings, or the pathways into the brain. I think it's, everybody should be able to look at a hearing test and to tell what, what is normal. And uh, I'm sure you're, you can do this, but just to review it briefly, uh, this is a, an audiogram, and a, a standard audiogram, sorry, this, you're testing up here frequencies from 250 hertz to 8,000 hertz, which is a standard test in hearing. The speech range is really between 500 and about 4,000. Right in here is the speech range, and that's really what's the most important. And uh, 
you test each ear separately with these tones and see when they perceive them. And the, by convention, the circles are the right ear and the X's are the left ear. So you can check both ears and see when they hear at what level. And this on the side is decibels. The greater the decibels, the worse the hearing. So then we say what is normal, normal is between zero and 20 decibels. There's a wide range. Hearing is, is so vast that it has to be, this is a logarithmic scale of when you look at our band, it's not linear. And each 10 divisions, each division of 10 decibels increases by tenfold. So when you look at our grant, you see if it was 20 or below or 25 or below, I'd say, then you know they have normal hearing in, in, in either ear. And then mild loss is, as you can see, 20 to 40 dB and moderate is more to 60 dB. And, and an easy way to remember that is and up to about the moderate degree, which is just, the decibels are similar to the percent of hearing loss. People I ask, what percent is my hearing loss? And so if you look at their one ear and it is about 30 decibel level for that ear in the speech range, look at the speech range, then you've got about a 30 percent hearing loss. It gets, when you get in the really more severe and profound, the percentage does not correlate quite as easily as it does the decibels. So let's talk, let's talk about some common things in, with a conductive loss. Conductive being something's wrong with the conductive mechanism going into the ear. And, it, and in this particular audiogram, what you see here is, you see that the left ear is down about around 40, 45 dB, and the right ear is around 30, 25 to 30 dB. So this would be a, a mild loss, and this starts to be a moderate loss. But it, but when they, they, when you do a hearing test, you can. This is testing the sound coming through the ear, like an earphone over your ear or insert into the ear canal. You can test the inner ear directly without going through the ear. You, you just call it uh, bone conduction, and it tells you what the cochlea is hearing, regardless of what's happening in the middle ear and ear canal. And the cochlea is hearing here is normal, so the inner ear is normal here. That's that's why we call this a conductive loss. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, the simple things that we have to look at when patients come in, they say they don't hear, and uh, it's just impacted the room. Wax building up in the ear canal that blocks the ear. That can produce a 15, 20 decibel hearing loss if it's completely blocking the ear canal. It's really amazing. A, just a small you may not be able to see the eardrum very well, but if you can see any part of the eardrum, that, that little space, you, you'd be amazed how this hearing will still be normal, but it's only when it really blocks it completely that it becomes a loss. And that's easy to correct by with the removal of that, uh, either with with a, uh, with a irrigation or with a, a small curette. Uh, I don't encourage uh, people in general practice or general medicine to take it out, but, but not because they can't do it. It's, it's usually don't have all the equipment. We use a microscope to do it, which gives us binocular vision looking in the ear canal, which is so much easier than if you're trying to look with just one eye through a uh, otoscope or something. It's so much more difficult. And you, there's so many nerve endings in the ear canal, just to touch the edge of the ear canal is painful for patients. So anyway, that's an easy to correct the problem. And then another a common thing we when we're going to try to make this more related to, to our adult population and older population is fluid in the middle ear space. And this is, a, this is where fluid builds up behind the eardrum. And so it keeps the eardrum from vibrating and sound hits it. It's called a serous otitis media or middle ear with a fusion. But it has no acute symptoms. There's no pain in the ear. They just feel stopped up, and you wouldn't know if you, if you, until you look whether it was fluid or wax or you know what, what the reason was. But if you look in there and see the ear has fluid behind the eardrum, then uh, and especially in adults, there's something wrong with the station tube. And in, in a, an adult who has fluid behind a, a, a ear on one side is a, some a sign of a pathology in the nasal pharynx, like a tumor of the nasal pharynx, which could be blocking the station tube on that side and something that needs to be investigated. 
But every time we get a cold or get an upper respiratory tract infection, you know you feel stopped up for a few days. That's because a little bit of fluid builds up behind your eardrum if you the cold is in your head and it's temporary and the ones that resolve your hearing comes back to normal. So that's that's a that's a, that's not a serious problem. It happens in both ears. You know there's a reason for it. It's when you don't have a reason for it that you have to look for what's blocking that you station do to be concerned about it. And then perforation of the eardrum. These a, a eardrum can be perforated from many different things, uh, from people poking something in the ear, maybe they're out of working the shrubs and the branch or a little bush pokes in their ear or they're putting a Q-tip in the ear and they jam, somebody hits their hand while they're doing it. It can happen from sports related things, uh, particularly diving or water skiing where they fall and hit on the water where there's uh, a, com a compression against the ear, against the head, side of the head. Is uh, I was I practiced in Austin for 20 something years and I, a lot of people would pick the university when you ski and then in the, especially in the warmer months and I would see a perforated eardrum from people falling off water skis at probably once a month at least falling hitting and, and they come in because they 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 could feel the pain immediately they noticed the decreased hearing and they usually started having drainage coming from that ear. So this is the right ear just to look at a normal ear. Uh, it just this color is not real good up there compared to what I'm looking at on my laptop here, but a normal looking eardrum with uh, a, a thin, it'd be kind of a gray colored membrane here, maybe slightly pinkish. It, um, this is the malleus, the first bone behind the tympanic membrane. But it has a normal contour, it's, it's uh, contour shape, and uh, that's as opposed to this, this is a, mm -hmm. a serous otitis media, a middle ear effusion, where a patient feels stopped up that has no other symptoms. And uh, you see this kind of beige looking fluid filling the middle ear. You notice the chalky white uh, look of the malleus, which is as opposed to the other view, it doesn't look that chalky looking as it does, as this one does right here. And then how this sticks out more than this, when you look at the normal, you don't see it so obviously. That's all retraction of the tin bed membrane, and that'll produce about a 15 to 25 decibel conductive loss. This is a small hole in the eardrum, which can occur about from an infection. The infection uh, bacteria can produce some, some necrosis of the tin membrane. Many times you get an ear infection, and we don't have any problem with the eardrum, but if you do get a hole in the eardrum, a small one like this will not affect your hearing if it's if it's uh, uh, less than it, say 20 percent of the size of the TM of the tympanic membrane. In most perforations of the eardrum, whether it's traumatic or even infection, will heal spontaneously. And uh, most of these skiing accidents and stuff we're talking about, where or somebody is slapped on the side of the head, most of the time that eardrum will heal. You give it. A, a, a few weeks to see if it doesn't heal before you proceed with anything surgically. Now, there are times when it won't heal, and this is an example of a, a, a pretty severe infection, and the whole eardrum is gone just about. You just see the malleus here with the tip, and you see the rim of the drum around like this. Now, this will produce significant conductive hearing loss, and uh, this can be repaired surgically. You can put a a graft in here, call it a, a fascial graft you take from the, over the temporalis muscle adjacent to the ear. But this is the promontory of the middle ear. You're looking towards your station tube over here. This is the this is the malleus that goes up, connects to the incus. This is the incus coming down and hitting the stapes, which is going into the inner ear. And the motion of that bone, or, or what we're looking at, is a uh, up and down motion, in and out like a piston, microscopically moving to transmit sound into the inner ear. Uh, another thing in adults we see, and this is much, uh, it's called otosclerosis. Patient comes in and said, I'm, 
I've noticed my, one, usually on one side they've noticed the hearing has gone down, but it's been very, very gradual. Uh, and it, but and this is more common in women than men. And uh, it usually starts, they can really, in fact, if you really, uh, if they have somebody who's done a hearing test, they can start as early as the teens or 20s, but doesn't really become enough that they seek help many times that their upper 30s or 40 years old before they go and see somebody about it because it, it is it's so slow at onset that you almost become used to that being normal for you and you don't really think about it until it gets to a certain intensity, then you really notice there's a difference between the two ears. Otosclerosis is a, a, a buildup of new bone in the, around the ossicle, around the bones in the middle ear, and we don't know the cause of it. But we do know it, it is, since the 1950s, is correctable with surgery. It's not correctable with any medication, and the hearing can be brought back to normal. And this, the orient you hear, we're looking at the, we're looking the ear canal. We made an incision and raised up the eardrum. This we're looking at the undersurface of the drum. We're looking into the middle ear. And this is the malleus on the underside of the eardrum. Then this is the incus and the stapes. Well, this new bone grows up around the stapes foot plate and keeps it from moving in and out. It goes back and forth like that. Now think a minute. This is a, di a diagram of what that does. It, it looks like a I, I patients in the sense they've got some calcium built up around your uh, one of the bones in the middle ear, and it's almost always this bone right here, the stapes. And uh, that slowly causes this stop from vibrating gradually and then gives up to about a 30 to 40 dB hearing loss, go up to mild to moderate. And then it's pretty well levels off at that point. But we can take, with the operating microscope, go into the ear, remove this this stapes which would be affected and put a prosthesis. This is one of the prostheses, there's several, that fits fits in there, uh, it clips, uh, you, it goes, it attaches to the, to the ecos and goes down into this area here. And it can bring the hearing back to the normal range. It has a over 90% success rate of, of uh, correcting the hearing loss. So I'm going to move on to some common causes of, of uh, centineural hearing loss. This is more than related to the cochlea of the inner ear. And let's talk about a, a very common thing you see today is noise-induced hearing loss. And uh, it used to be that we, in the industrial world, in the, in the working world, we had a lot of noise in our in industries and people would have hearing loss way to being around loud noise over a work day of eight hours for day after day. And uh, that has been with, with all the regulations of OSHA and all the other uh, uh, things they've done to reduce noise levels and wear ear protection. And now it's shifted to more of our, the people are using uh, these uh, uh, Walkmans or iPods where they have, for the moment they turn them up a loud volume and a constant barrage of noise eventually causes a hearing loss. And uh, so to give you some idea, I'll show you more of this. We, 85 to 90 dB is a safe level for hearing it over a period of time. That's kind of the standard set by the AMA and the uh, Academy of Laryngology and, and the federal government. Uh, but it's, 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 uh, it doesn't take much increase in the sound intensity to start doing uh, injury to your hearing, and it's, it's, this is really the key thing. The louder the sound pressure level, or the louder the noise, the shorter time it needs to produce an injury to your hearing. So if you're listening, if you're at 105 decibel noise level and you stayed in that for more than 30 minutes and we measured your hearing, you would have some measurable hearing loss at that point with just, with that change. Now, that, when, if you've ever been to a concert or been to any loud noise environment and you, you go out and you leave and you notice you feel more stopped up, don't feel like you're hearing quite as well, but by the next day it seems okay. This is called a temporary threshold shift, and that happens when you get that. The ear does get some temporary damage, but it, it recovers, and uh, it comes back to normal. 
But what happens is if repeated exposures, it never comes all the way back to where it was before after repeated exposure, and eventually it starts coming down because you don't ever recover 100% of it every time. So repeated exposures is going to start producing a hearing loss. And when you look at these people's audiogram, the key to it, if you think they come in and you do it, and maybe they don't even complain of the hearing, but you look at their hearing test, and then on the hearing test, it will show a dip at 4,000 hertz. You go across and dip down and come back up. That is a real key sign that they're having injury from noise exposure, and they need to be told that whatever they're doing, they need to wear ear protection. And ear protection is the key to prevent noise. So anytime you are going to use equipment that's going to be loud, whether it's lawn equipment or power tools or any kind of noise, if you're going to be in a noisy environment, you should wear ear protection. And when you go to a store, like a sporting goods store, you should tell them you want, and it should be on the package, you want ear protection that has at least 20 dB. Really, you want 20, 25 to 30 dB. Because some of these ear protections they sell doesn't protect you more than 5 or 10 dB, and they're worthless. So you, it, it's required that they put how much protection they're giving you when you buy those. And to give you some idea how much what noise these are, these are very injurious to your hearing if you're right next to it and you have that. Like uh, if you're, that's why you need to wear ear protection when you're hunting. The decibels of a shotgun are almost every top pilot, and I saw a lot of pilots in my practice that came in to see me all had high frequency hearing losses uh, from being around jet engines so much, and people that work on flight lines in the Air Force had the same same thing, but. Normal conversation is around 60 dB, and if you know, even in a library where it's quiet, that's 40 dB level. So this is this some idea of the different noise, different things produce, can can and cause hearing loss, and it's it's all preventable, and it's usually re reversible if you don't keep repeating it. Now that this is something that pertains, I'm sure, to your practice and patients you see, and that's presbycusis, which is a loss of hearing with, pet, with our age. And if you plot the average hearing loss of 60, 50, 60, 70, and 80 year old, that gradually, the average gradually drops down each year, each decade, and the high frequencies more than any other frequencies. Uh, so that if you look at an average of a 50-year-old and a 70-year-old, you'll see the much greater loss in the high frequencies as a whole. And this is, it's some aging or deterioration of the nerve endings in the inner ear, as well as in the brain. One of the things about presbycusis is they complain more that they, it's not that they can't hear, they don't understand. Their speech discrimination becomes Less. There are two scores when you look at hearing tests. You look at what their average speech reception threshold is, or SRT, and you want that to be between 0 and 20, 25, and you look at their speech discrimination. Speech discrimination should be 90, 90 to 100%. They'll come in and, this, and yet their, their pure tone average in their hearing, their ear may only be about 30 or 25, which is not too bad, but their speech discrimination may be 80 percent instead of 90 to 100. And that's and that's part of it, I think, is related to sound processing in the brain as well as the cochlear itself. But it is a real problem, and it is usually symmetrical. Both ears are affected equally, and it is a problem that can be helped. And that and those, those people can be helped if they get to the point where they need uh, amplification, uh, they, they can use they can hearing aid can be extremely helpful to them, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Other things you got to be concerned about: people say they're having trouble with their hearing, especially in, in an older population. Is what IV antibiotics have been on? Because in life-threatening diseases, there's always the possibility that you get something that is ototoxic, uh, if, and when they're giving it, uh, and if, particularly if they have compromised renal function, which increases the concentration of that antibiotic in their system, which then causes more damage to the, 
to the inner ear. Genomycin and step, we don't see much step anymore, but genomycin still used, and they both affect the balance system more than they affect the hearing, but they can affect the hearing. And uh, in fact, we use genomycin injected into the middle ear to control people with Meniere's disease when we can't control them with medications sometimes because it will suppress their vestibular response. Then also the, the, the uh, chemo drugs, cisplatin, can cause a high frequency hearing loss, but it's reversible usually once they, they get off of it. But that's, and uh, we don't see much quinine usually, but large doses of aspirin, I'm talking about maybe people that were taking eight to 12 a day can get some ototoxic symptoms from that, and it's more more common for aspirin to cause tinnitus than it is to, as well as hearing loss. That, and those are usually reversible too once they lower the, their level. And then diuretics, so some of the loop diuretics can cause a, a, a overall a suppression of all the range of hearing throughout the, across from the low to high frequency, but these also usually reverse when they stop them. So those are things you think about in the hearing loss. I don't want to dwell on this, but I just want to say that heredity and genetic things are a common reason for hearing loss. And we, you know, with a large percent of patients who have a central hearing loss, there is some genetic cause for it. And the, the importance of that is to la ask about family history. If the like mother or father or aunts and uncles or grandparents had, are, are having had trouble with hearing before the age of 50, because that is, may, they may be more predisposed genetically to hearing loss. And, and the, there's different types of hereditary uh, hearing loss. And, but dealing with adults, the kind that, you, that I would think you'd be more concerned with would be the non-syndrome type of hearing loss that is a late onset in life, and that's the most common type of hearing loss that we see. In other words, it comes on in 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, a gradual hearing loss. It usually gets symmetrical in both ears, and there is a family history of hearing loss. And those people can be helped with, also with amplification. Uh, this is something that I think more people need to be aware of. It's called a sudden hearing loss. Are y'all familiar with that? Do you, you ever see patients with sudden hearing loss here? Yeah, I have a sudden hearing loss with uh, diving. Uh-huh, the diving. They perforated, they yeah. dive. Well, this is a little different. That could be a sudden hearing loss, but I see this at least once a month, and it's more common in in people, I'd say, 40 or 50 and above, but it can occur in younger ages, but it's more more common in older age group. And they will, their history is this. They'll come in and say, oh, I got up this morning and I felt fine, but I went to use the telephone and I, uh, I noticed I couldn't hear in one ear. Or I could barely hear the person I hear that. And, and I checked with the other ear, it was just fine. I said, I haven't had any pain. I haven't had any, any dizziness. Uh, usually the symptoms are are minimal except they don't, their hearing is changed. And it can change from mild to moderate. Most of the time I see it, it's a moderate to, to severe hearing loss. And it's usually, it can be all the way across or it can be in the high frequencies. It really varies a lot. But, and we don't, we don't know what causes this. There's a suspicion that it's a, a vascular thing that happens in the cochlea. Uh, it's a viral thing, the most common, uh, the most popular thing is they think it's a virus that gets into the cochlea and causes this change. It usually only happens in one ear, but it's just like taking a switch and turning your your hearing off. And I mean, I, I've seen it's, it seems to be more common in women than men. They'll come in the office and they'll have. I had a, a previous patient I've seen they had normal hearing. They come in, they have normal hearing in one ear, and the ear will be way down. It'll be 40, 50 decibel loss. And uh, this is a sudden hearing loss. It usually occurs over a few hours to, to no more than, than a, a 48 hours. But it's a rapid loss over a short period of time, and it's classified as sudden if it happens within that time span. 
these people need to be seen by an otologist or otolaryngologist unless you treat it yourself immediately or right away within 24 to 48 hours because it's the their feeling is that if they can if you get them on steroids they have a higher percentage of getting a recovery of this loss than if we we say well you know wait wait a week or two and let's see how you're doing or unfortunately sometimes people think oh you've got fluid behind your ear when they really don't the ear is perfectly normal and they'll put them on a decongestant and come back and say my hearing is any better and we miss that opportunity to try to correct this problem so if you find a, a patient says a sudden loss of hearing and they have no other symptoms, you look at the ear and you don't really see any redness or fluid there, then that is a sudden hearing loss and it needs immediate treatment. They can recover even without treatment spontaneously and about, I would say, about half the time approximately they will recover. They may not recover all the way, it, or it may, partially, partially it's, it's not, it's uh, it, it can be, uh, I would say that about 40% of the time they cover most of the hearing loss, but that's still, you've got a, a large percent who do not cover, they may recover half of what they lost, or they may not recover at all. I've had some who never recovered. They, they had lost a hearing in that ear. And of course, that's, when you're used to having hearing in both ears and you lose one, it's really dramatic to how it affects you because you don't localize sound if you don't have two ears. You have more trouble with people talking to you on one side. Uh, it's, it's quite an inconvenience. And uh, sometimes it's enough that can be helped with a hearing aid. Sometimes it's beyond what a hearing aid would be. Briefly talk about retrochocal pathology. I just want to make you aware when you see a patient who has a hearing loss in one ear and, uh, and it's an adult and they don't have any other symptoms, except hearing loss, maybe they have tinnitus in the ear. Some will have a little dizziness, some will not. You, one of the things you have to think about is a small tumor, benign tumor in the inner ear, in the internal auditory canal, which develops on the surface of the vestibular nerve, and is it, it's like a benign small tumor of the nerve sheet, and as it expands in this bony canal, it starts squeezing down on the, on the nerve for balance and the nerve for hearing loss. But one of the first signs of an acoustic neuroma is hearing loss. And if it, and I see more, I see more of these from, picked up from general doctors who send them because they have a hearing loss on one side. And when you do it, you can do an ABR, auditory brain stem response test, which is a fairly easy thing to do. It's non-invasive. Most audiologists can do it or you, the gold standard would be an MRI, which is much more expensive, but if you do that, you'll pick this up. The ABR will tell you if there's some suspicion of something there, unless it's extremely small, like two millimeters or less, but otherwise it'll pick it up. But MRI will pick up even the smallest thing. So these are, these are things if we catch early, it's much easier to correct. This is only correctable if it needs to be corrected with surgery or irradiation. It's not correctable with any medication. Now, hearing aids is, I'm sure that something you, um, you're gonna be asked about, and uh, hearing aids have really changed in the last few years, really changed. They, they, they have really become more than something that just amplifies <laughs> all sounds to be very selective of what sounds they do amplify. And these new digital aids, that they can adjust each frequency for how much loudness they want in that frequency or turn some of them completely off. So they can take a hearing loss and see you got a hearing loss in certain frequencies and the other frequencies are normal. They can adjust that aid just for those frequencies you need amplification without going into the other frequencies. And uh, they have, they've got where they can put the little tiny microphone down in the ear canal next to the eardrum. They've just made a lot of improvements in hearing aids and uh, the, it has to overcome the reputation of the old hearing aids where people did usually would just leave them on their bedside table and not use them. But uh, they really, if you have a, a hearing loss that needs a hearing aid, you will do much better in, with understanding people and getting uh, communication with socially. 
with, with hearing aids now. Than, so if you look at their hearing test and they have a hearing loss that's more than 30 decibels in the better ear, in the better ear, look at the better ear, which one? And it's in the speech range, and that we're, we're talking about here. And their speech discrimination score is going down. Then they're a definite candidate for hearing aid, and you should send for to have them to uh, to an audiologist or an otolaryngologist to have them uh, evaluate them to see if they if they think they uh, should benefit. And when they when you in hearing aids, you can. Uh, uh, it's by the law in Texas. You are allowed to try it out for 30 days and return it for your full return of your cost of your hearing aid if you don't feel it's working for you or you don't like it. This, the crux is to be sure you get it back before 30 days because you're protected by the law so that you're not stuck with something that's not going to help you. So people have a chance to really see how much it's going to do for them, whether they're using one or two. And this is just an example. This is a low frequency hearing aid a low frequency hearing loss, and this is more general all the way across. But you can see that's, well, this one just shows right at 30, but if the hearing loss was that down in here and there's speech discrimination, with the, even if it's up 85 or so, it still, they may benefit if they start having, because you're missing a lot of hearing once you start getting into this area down here. Now, hearing loss, well, There, there's a limit to what hearing aids can do, and if you get a hearing loss down here, hearing aids aren't going to help. They're going to help up to about 70, 80 dB right in here, from here to here, in the speech range. By the way, when we talk about perspicuous and we see a high frequency drop off here, it goes across and starts dropping down like this. We don't really have to have these high frequencies. If somebody has good hearing in them, in most, up to 3,000 hertz, near 25 or less, and you see that on their hearing test, that's adequate, probably they do not need something, even if it drops way down here, because these are beyond the speech range, these frequencies are, they're nice to hear, and if you like music, especially like violins and stuff like that, which are high frequency, you will not hear those as well, but for all everyday communications, if this is the area you want to look at. Uh, are you, this is an, something that's come about in my, lifetime as a resident and uh, as, no as a, a general in the practice of otology as a cochlear implant i never thought this would work when it first came out because i was practicing when it first came out people that were profoundly deaf they were able to put electrodes by surgery into the inner ear and those people were able to hear and and uh i'm not, i was absolutely wrong when it first came out and was skeptical about it because it is incredible what this has done for patients uh, who have lost their hearing. This is particularly useful in two instances. In infants who are born deaf, if they're implanted within the first year or two, by the time they, in, they're implanted and have the proper education, by the time they're in the first grade of kindergarten, they're mainstream. And they're, they are, but let's go to adults. If a, an adult has lost their hearing after they learn, after they had speech and had hearing, this is post-lingual deafness. This is not the same as somebody who was an adult who was born deaf and never, never, always signed and never spoke or you couldn't understand them. This, I don't think it works as good for them though. That, let's don't get off into that. The main purpose is if somebody who has had, had, had hearing, fairly normal hearing or even a mild loss, but developed as it went, I got older, lost hearing either from disease or a hereditary thing, autoimmune disease, whatever it is, they can be implanted with the cochlear implant and that hearing will come all the way across almost uh, to normal. And uh, their speech discrimination becomes much improved. Yes? In the infants, do they grow learning how to live? Do, do they do what? Do they learn because they, they have some hearing loss? Do they learn how to, to read the lips when they're very little unconsciously, or is it that they train their brain to have the range of speech? Wait, would mean if they're operation. implanted or not implanted? Uh, if they're implanted. You're if they're saying impl they learn how to hear with the they hear, cochlea. When, oh, they hear when they hear 
when they they think the brain has some kind of what's the right word learning curve or input that is possible when they're very in but late say by the age of five or six and if the brain gets the input of sound because it's not the loss of the deafness in an infant is the hair cells are missing it's not the nerve that goes from the cochlea to the brain it's not the brain in 90 percent of the time it's something was wrong with the hair cells hair cells are nerve endings that's the word they use for them. this replaces the hair cells and sends in the hair, hair cells send an electric signal up the nerve to the brain these these tiny electrodes by bio medical engineering have figured out what these impulses are and it can reproduce it so they send that same signal and so they perceive it as sound like you and I do now I've done hundreds of cochlear implants and I I've asked my adult patients who I can early on I said what sound sound like to you because they became deaf and then they were implanted and the, and they said at first it sounded a little bit like computer speech to them but very quickly it sounded like normal speech to within uh, within six months but but they they to them they hear sound I mean it's like they they can recognize uh, different people, different voices and stuff. It's just amazing. And it has really been refined. It came out in the late 60s. Now in the, in the 2000s, they have got these things so much, I mean, even more so than they did when they first came out. And they're now bilaterally. We used to, we used to be good only implant one ear. And, uh, but now they're implanting both sides, and especially in infants. And, small children but you need to do it in infants actually the younger the better there's a lot of difference if you implant somebody between one and two and if you waited three and four because you've lost that opportunity for the brain to receive that information to develop what you're talking about speech and understanding so this is a one of the most significant things I think in hearing in this century or in the last century the do they have to be replaced? do what? Do, do they have to be replaced? Like if you implant them in a baby, will they last for the rest of the person's life? Yes, because uh, interesting thing, the the ear, the cochlea, and the bones of the middle ear are adult size at birth, mm -hmm. so they never change. Mm -hmm. Now there is a the growth in the in the ear itself, and there, when you implant these, there's enough flexibility to let the growth allow that it doesn't interfere with it. But you know, we only have a history now of 20 years or so. You know, we'll see in 50 years. Yeah, you know, but, yeah. but I've never been so impressed with this. From the patients who impressed me, not what the people who talked about it. <laughs> it's the patients who about it really made me convinced how good it was. So they won't break or get rusty. Well, we, yeah, they can. They don't. No, it's implanted. It's underneath the skin. You don't see anything. You don't see anything that's implanted, and the signal is sent with a little processor that is like a hearing aid. It goes behind your ear, and there's a magnet in the implant part that holds that there, it holds it, and it sends a radio signal, FM signal, into the implant that sends it into the brain. It goes, so there's no direct correction, correction between the outside part. So you take off the, the, the what's called the sound, the uh, speaker part of it, or the part that's worn outside that looks most people like a hearing aid, but it's not. And it, you know, you don't, you don't have to wear that necessarily at night or something. Or if you're going to participate in some kind of athletic stuff, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go swimming with it. You wouldn't go. If you're going to play sports, you'd wear a helmet to protect yourself because you still could get a blow to this area, which could injure the yourself as well as the implant. Do we need to check them periodically or something like that? Do, do we what? Need, do we need to check them periodically? Or? Yes. Once they're, once they're implanted, the, the, the audiologist does the, the special people who train these people, especially the infants. Now, the adults don't need as much training because they already know what speech is mm -hmm. and, and they recognize speech. Mm -hmm. But uh, they have to go through a pretty intensive education period for a period of time. But the surgeon, I, we check our implant patients at least once a year after we've implanted. It, it, at first, we check them every six months, and then it's once a year. But usually, they don't need much pain. This is another thing that's a surgical procedure that called a Baja. It's developed in Scandinavia. 
And it's, it, it's a way to get sound in the inner ear through bone conduction. It, and it's a, this is a minimal and basic thing. It's about a 30, 45 minute procedure where you put something back over the mastoid bone uh, that, uh, I'm sorry I don't have a picture of it, that transmits the sound through the bone to the, to the cochlea. And, it, uh, and it's, it's, it's for situations where the patient may have had multiple surgeries on the ear and they're so, so uh, let's say deformed or scarred that ear, ear, they can't wear hearing aids, or they may have a congenital absence of the ear canal, atresia, and instead of trying to reconstruct that canal, which is not always successful, you can put a Baja on these patients and they will hear, if they have, if they're normal, if their hearing is near normal in the inner ear, they'll do extremely well with this type of hearing. Um, and this, this has one other use. If you have somebody who has a, had a tumor in the inner ear, acoustic neuroma, and you had to remove it, you also lose your hearing when that happens. If they have normal hearing on the other side, you can put the Baja on the bad side and they will then get sound coming from the bad side to, to make up for that loss. It going, it'll take it to the other ear, but they will be aware of sound coming from the side that normally was deaf. Uh, you, you said something, say something about dizziness, but, and I don't, I don't, I'm not going to dwell on this. This is the end of my presentation, but I just want to make a couple points because uh, I, I think we went out of time here. The, you know, how often we see patients with dizziness, and especially I think in the older population, it's a common problem. And it's a, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's really uh, hard to know sometimes what to do with these patients. But there's dizziness that's related to the inner ear and there's dizziness that is not related primarily to the ear. And it's about 50-50. Not all patients with dizziness are related to the inner ear. If it is the inner ear, the key things are gonna be, they're gonna have intermittent episodes of dizziness or vertigo. Let's use the word vertigo. It's not it's going to occur and stop and the length of how long it lasts helps you decide what of the inner ear problems it is. If it's the true sensation of motion moving, like they feel like the room is spinning, the floor is moving, some sensation of motion, that is part of the inner ear. And then the duration of the symptom is very important because if they say I'm dizzy all the time, I'm constantly dizzy, I'm off balance, I'm lightheaded, that is not an inner ear problem. So I think that the three most common causes of inner ear type of dizziness is a benign positional vertigo, which is a very common problem. And that's where you get dizziness when you get in certain positions that less, it lasts less than a minute. And uh, it's usually like somebody turns one direction and also they feel probably dizzy for a few seconds and it goes away. Or they're in bed and they turn over. That is and that diagnosis is made by doing what's called a Dix Hall pack maneuver. That's where you sit the patient on the exam table and, and, and put their head down with the, the, with the, 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 the ear that's affected is down and they'll get vertigo for, for 20 or 30 seconds. If you do one side and the other, you can, that's the way you make the diagnosis. And it's very treatable with vestibular exercises. It's called a, an Eckley maneuver. Or you, but most of our older languages can be familiar with it, and also physical therapy that deals with, with problems of balance would be familiar with it. This is very treatable, and it's usually self-limited, but it's, it's something that can be controlled. And then uh, the other two entities here are, are, uh, have to do with this uh, vestibular, that's a viral thing that when it gets into the inner ear, it has no hearing loss. They, they, they have a history of Vertigo, very severe, they have to lay down, they can't stand, they can feel nauseated, they may vomit, and it's intense, and it lasts, you know, it may last uh, several hours, uh, 30 minutes to two or three hours, and then they feel kind of off balance for another 24 probably, and it, then it goes away, but it may come back two or three times. Uh, but usually in a few days it goes away. Usually, usually it's a self-limited problem, and usually within three or four weeks, to six weeks, it's gone completely. 
this is treated symptomatically and uh, remember about this is there's no hearing loss you just have the vestibular symptoms and that's treated with just suppressants for their if they need it for their uh, dizziness uh, you know like low dose valium or uh, uh, meclizine or something uh, along that order and then Meniere's disease, a lot of people get called they have Meniere's disease, and, and uh, this is a distinct entity where you do have vertigo that lasts from 20 to 30 minutes to two or three hours, but you have fluctuating hearing loss and you have tinnitus, and it's usually in one ear, and uh, that's it's because of the pressure in the inner ear has become elevated and uh, we don't know the etiology of that either, but that's very treatable with uh, low salt diet, low caffeine, uh, vestibular suppressant medication, and diuretics. And 80% of these patients can be controlled with medical therapy. Only a few come, there is some surgical procedures can do for that, and that's where I said we use the genomycin also for failure of medical therapy. But. This is a real entity, it does occur, but remember, it, they're completely clear of their dizziness between attacks. The attacks may occur like once, from once every two or three days to once every week or two, but they're between attacks, they don't feel any, any vertigo, but they do have a hearing loss usually, and the hearing loss fluctuates. When they're having an attack, the hearing loss goes down, typically in low frequencies, but it may come all the way back to normal when they're not having it. It, it typically, it, over a year, period of years, it, hearing loss progresses in the ear to become more moderate to severe. So that completes my my discussion on those things. Is it a lifetime uh, management for the Meniere's disease? Like, if they start to drink, get better and start drinking coffee and having salt again, does it usually recur? It, it can go in remission and never come back again. I'd say the typical course is about 10 years. But it really varies quite a bit. It, if, uh, I think there are patients who have, gone, have recovered, have not had a severe case of it, and they've recovered. And if they, they test themselves. They may find it when they start drinking more coffee or tea or something, they start having more symptoms. I think one of the biggest factors is salt intake because it retains the fluid retention. And I think if you really restrict the salt intake, we tell them to try to stay on a 2,000 to 1,500 salt restricted diet, which if they do, they really do better. Because most people won't do that. They, they, they'll eat salt on their food or the processed foods or potato chips. And, but if they really cut down, that really does help them a lot. And then there are others who have more fortunately, a little smaller percentage who progressively had this problem and they it's almost incapacitated. They, they end up with severe hearing loss. Uh, they may end up having to have something done surgically. To the most extreme would be we go in and and remove all the parts of the inner ear on that side. But that, that those people really usually have no hearing or very little hearing anyway, so that's not a factor. But that does resolve it for them. But they, their hearing loss is also normal. Is the hearing loss that occurs with gentamicin, is that permanent? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Usually it is. Yeah. How about aspirin? Same. Aspirin, aspirin can be reversible. Usually, you mean if it's, if it's not too long a period that they've had the problem. How about if you get the tinnitus? Is that like alarm paste? Yeah, that, that, that tinnitus is a warning sign that you're probably going to, you may proceed the hearing loss. That's right. And it can go away if you drop it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just to make sure I, I got the, the neurosensor field. I'm sorry, yeah. The neurosensor yeah. Uh, loss, it occurs um, from exposure, right? To and you lose the low pitch. Uh, from noise exposure? The, the presbyacusia, let's say. Presbyacusia. Old people can hear if you talk like that better than if you lower your voice. 
No, they lose high frequency. Oh, okay. The I'm sorry if I said it's, it's high. No, 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 no. I must have missed it. They, they yeah. tend to lose. So if you, you plotted it uh, after a decade, the, the high frequency gets tends to go lower and lower, more and more loss in high frequency. But eventually, it works into the lower, into the upper end of the speed range, or it can come all the way across. But typically, it's high frequency hearing loss in Presbyterian. So if you talk to the elderly patients, if you try to lower your tone, it's better. Well, it may be, and you just need to speak up to them, yeah. Right. Well, and they complain that they they complain that they don't understand, even though they hear. Because of the. the and I, I think that's something to do. It has to do with some speech processing, and well, it with with some changes of atrophy in the central nervous system, and some vascular ischemia, you know. And the autosclerosis processes the other way around. Autosclerosis is what? The other way around, you can hear better if it's high pitch. Uh, low otosclerosis typically affects the low frequencies first, yes. But that's a conductive loss, and that's correctable, right? One more question. <laughs> if somebody likes to hear loud music, should it go up in the bass or go up in the treble? Which damage is more, the high pitch music or the low? It depends on the decibel level. So just volume. It yeah, matter. the volume. Okay. It's the volume. <laughs> if you if you if you ever been around somebody that has a headset on and you can hear the music, mm -hmm. it's too damn loud. <laughs> That's most so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the battery or the volume. It's just the volume. Mm -hmm. It's okay. the volume. And the higher the volume, the the, the more injury you're going to get, especially over a period of time. Yeah. That's really I think that's really showing up to be a significant. And if you're, I've, I've, I had a, a young boy came to me, a UT student. He went to a concert. He sat right in front of the speakers, and it was a blasting rock concert. And he had a 40 to 50 hearing loss, permanent. Permanent. And that was just, I mean, he just stayed there. He stayed there too long. I mean, that was that was not. That's not typical. That's. The, I'm talking about sitting in front of the speaker. You know, not. He's right there. It's the blast of it coming out, and you know how loud those things can be. That, but if you listen to enough of that over a period of time, you will start. You'll start seeing first the high frequency loss, and then start even more. You do it, it keeps on going down, and then it starts working towards the low frequency, coming in the middle of frequencies first. We all, I'm sure everybody's at parties with loud music. Yeah. Well. You know, even when you go to a party, if it's a loud music, you can work. You can put some earplugs in, and nobody, and you can nobody still hear it pretty good. You know, <laughs> maybe you like it. <laughs> you don't like to hear the steps of people. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. That was very Thank interesting. Yes, I learned a lot. Thank you. Very, very good. Do you mind? Would you put your PowerPoint?